It is Monday morning and I just stopped into the store to get some tea and I saw an older gentleman wearing a mask and buying four packs of cigarettes, which has me a little confused. <laughs> Walking up the stairs backwards early in the morning is not fun. The older I get, the longer it takes me to warm up into my day and feel physically powerful, but that's okay. That's just part of aging. Just getting to my sister's house. Got to feed her cats, guinea pigs, fish, snails. <laughs> and there go the church bells. It's eight o'clock. Listen to those birds. It's February. Why aren't these birds south? Oh, look at that. Look at that. It's a giant shark. It's a giant shark boy. Hi, shark boy. And there goes a new new. Hi, new new. Oh, look at these piggies. Trudy and Plum. Who wants some hay? Hmm? Oh, it's Timothy Hay. A family of artists. My sister made the goat head. Her friend did the mushroom. Another friend did the Bernie. <laughs> um, sister's husband did some paintings around here as well. But house is full of art. Ooh, my grandfather did that one. Grandpa Van Orden. And that was my other grandpa did that one. Grandpa Rupp. My sister makes all kinds of paper mache masks, etc. This one is like three times the size of your head. And it was part of a performance for the Cleveland Art Parade. And my grandfather made that loon. And if you've never seen the Cleveland Art Parade, check it out online, it's a lot of fun. So the shelving unit that I picked up yesterday that I was just going to knock apart and use for lumber actually is a perfect fit over here under my exercise board. I would replace this and my little ottoman where I sit and change shoes and maybe have this whole wall shelves because the color matches. Anyway, I'm gonna move these two today and see if that's a good fit or not. Taking a break from editing to get a ski in. I want to maybe do a few short intervals just to test myself out. Uh, if I'm going to go to Worlds, I've got to start seeing what I'm made of. As I was just putting on my skate boots, it occurred to me that my ankle hasn't hurt once this year. Uh, last year, it got so bad that I couldn't even wear my skate boots because the supports that go up your lower calf, uh, these guys right here, they press into your ankle bone and it was so brutally painful that I couldn't even put them on, let alone ski in them. So last year at the World Championships, uh, the race that I actually completed, the 45K, I raced in classic boots, which offer no ankle support at all. Uh, so it's very hard to get balance and to maintain stability in a classic boot. Skate boots make your ankle really rigid, uh, at least laterally, side to side. So, yeah, that was one of the things that really got me pumped last year uh, at the World Championships, that I raced a 45K in classic boots and still did really well. That got me pumped to train harder for this year's Worlds. <laughs> but... Now that I'm seeing that my ankle isn't hurting, I'm wondering if I should start running again because that's why I haven't been running because my ankle is just a wreck. Um, but maybe it's calmed down. It's been a couple years of very little running and maybe it's bounced back enough. I don't know. Maybe I should try it. If you're ever going through the woods and there's snow in the ground, and suddenly you come to a lot of green debris, little branch snippings underneath the tree. Look up, because there's likely a chunky porcupine in there. Hey, Porky. 
What you doing? What's going on? Just chilling? Oh, you're cute, Porky. You're cute. Just hanging on a branch. So what they'll do is they'll trim off a lot of the branches. They eat them and the debris falls on the ground. That's how you spot them. Day one is done. And I'm feeling a little soreness in my upper body that I'm not used to. Doesn't feel that I'm working that hard at strength, and yet I'm more sore and tired than I have been throughout the past year, which is odd. So I wanna pay attention to that and be careful. Um, I don't wanna push. Maybe my body is still in recovery mode from whatever illness I had. So, yeah, odd. I wanna do more. Uh, I wanna aggressively get back into pull-ups and dips, but I'm sore and I don't know where it's coming from. Hey, shark. One of the things that I love about coming to my sister's house is this old map on the wall. Peoples of Europe based chiefly on language. It's from 1938. And you get to see all the different language groups in the 1930s as they were described. And what's interesting to me, I know very little about Ukraine and Russia, but the Crimean Peninsula was Russian and Tatar, and then north of it was Russian. Looks like the Donbass was Russian. So yeah, I have so little knowledge of that area. Um, also, there's a German-speaking group in the middle of Russia, just north of Kyrgyzstan. And the Bashirs, I don't know the Bashirs, the Karelians, I've heard of them, they have really interesting clothing. Um, the Sudets in Germany, the low, middle, and high Germans in France, Lang Doyl, Lang Doc, uh, and the Basque people in Spain. Yeah, so interesting. Hungarians, otherwise known as Magyars in Romania or Transylvania. Slovaks, Czechs, Poles. Uh, much of Poland, it looks like, spoke other languages. Anyway, fascinating. I love historical maps. Oh, sweet new new. Does Nuni want some belly rubs, hmm? Does Nuni want belly rubs? Does she? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Nuni. Yeah. What's this? It's Tuesday morning, or as many Vermonters say, Tuesday. I'm not feeling so great. I just finished the kitties and the guinea pigs and I'm kind of dragging. I ate way too much last night. Um, had a lot of coleslaw. I love coleslaw. Uh, it's just cabbage, carrots, apples, onions, and apple cider vinegar. That's pretty much it. Um, ton of that, but then my sister made a vegan ziti. She was testing out ricotta cheese recipes made out of tofu, and she nailed it. So I ate a lot of that ziti, and uh, I'm not doing so well today because of that. So I'm going to take my time, be gentle. I'm going to get myself into some movement now, a ski, a prospect. And I have historical challenges with eating, and I know that. So it's okay, the damage is done, but now I'm going to gently put my body into movement. Not harsh, just gentle, nice and slow, without any expectations. Uh, I have no idea how the workout will go. I'm not even looking at it as a workout. I'm just gonna go up, put my skis on, and shuffle about, and hopefully that shifts something, it usually does. Skiing on my beater skis today, 
these were the original skis that I skied with in 2021 when I got back into skiing. They're different lengths, they're different cambers or flexes, they're in <laughs> different weight, everything about them is different. But that's what was available to me when I got back into it, a buddy gave me uh, his leftovers. He broke one of the yellow, broke one of the black. This is what remains and they were fantastic all through 2021. And I probably ski on them 50% of the time. My good racing skis um, try not to use that much and today there's a lot of ice. So we're going with the beaters which haven't been waxed since 1996. That's when uh, my friend was using them. <laughs> It's interesting, I've got this fear of that Strava segment that part of me thinks I gotta go get it back or I gotta go test myself against it, which is wise in a way to see if I'm indeed in good enough shape to compete at a world level. But uh, it's also terrifying because uh, it's humbling. Like you find out what you're made of and that's an important thing to do in sport to find out what you're made of so that you can make adjustments and you can modify your training and and then you can be made of something else but initially it's it's terrifying to discover your position or rank <laughs> that was a pretty interesting ski i've got to keep reminding myself what this project is about like what are these videos about what is my writing about my coaching etc and it's so easy to forget that promoting a compassionate approach is my goal and is my process because my fragile identity wants to keep getting involved it wants to take credit it wants validation it wants to be seen as accomplished but that's not what I'm up to. I simply want to demonstrate that taking lots of small, gentle steps in the midst of a compassionate approach yields dividends, big ones. And uh, I have to keep stepping out of my identity because it wants to, wants to come along for the ride. So anyway, what happened today I was just skiing along comfortably, working on technique, and I could feel a resistance to doing the trail called workout because that's where the segment is that Johnny Hagenbach just took from me by 20 seconds. Took, he didn't take it. He skied really fast and did so faster than my best time. Uh, it's not a competition. See, identity again showing up. Anyway, I could feel myself avoiding that trail because I was scared of not measuring up. I was scared of not being Johnny Hagenbach, who is in his early 20s. Uh, he might be 20 or 21, I don't know. And he's just, he's incredible. He's one of the best junior skiers in the world. <laughs> Gonna be 55 in a month. And yet my identity feels that it needs to be equivalent. It's so fascinating. So anyway, I felt that resistance to even skiing on that trail, going anywhere near it. And I thought, okay, let's use the tools. Let's just gently move towards that trail. And I got myself in that direction, kept telling myself, it's okay, it's okay to ski on this trail. You've got nothing to prove. But then I hit the beginning of the segment and out of nowhere, my body just started moving faster. It wasn't a conscious choice, it was just happening. And I thought, okay, my body or some part of me wants to do this, but let's do it smart. Let's work on technique. Let's not just go crazy and punish ourselves because that's not what I'm about, not anymore. So let's see if we can just ski powerfully with really good technique. And you can quit whenever you want. You don't have to do the whole segment. Just imagine what it was like for them to ski in this beginning section. How would they have skied this to go that fast? Anyway, I got to the steeper section where I filmed them. It gets up to about a 13% climb. And I was feeling pretty strong and powerful and my technique was mostly holding together. Uh, and I thought, all right, that was good. And I was definitely breathing hard. My heart rate was probably in the high 170s. It was a little bit higher than a race pace heart rate. 
And then suddenly my body wasn't scared anymore. So I did some more intervals. I did one more on the workout hill. I did one more on the beaver pond loop, which also has a really steep, long climb. And then I came back just now and looked at the data. And I tied my fastest ever time on workout, two minutes and 20 seconds, still 20 seconds behind Johnny, but with much, much better technique than I did it last year when I set my best time. And on terrible skis with no waxing. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Okay, maybe I'm not further behind last year like I've been predicting, simulating. And my lungs still don't feel great. I'm still coughing out yuckiness. And my sinuses are draining all kinds of you don't want to know what. So I'm not fully healthy yet. And I matched my best time using terrible skis. And on the beaver pond loop, which is shorter and more intense, I miss my best time by only two seconds. So I'm in pretty good shape, even though I'm sick and even though the broken thumb has set me way, way back. Uh, I'm skiing well, and I've got to keep reminding myself, my entirety, that compassion, gentleness is what I'm about, what this project is about, showing people how to take small, gentle steps in directions that scare their identity. And if you discover your identity taking over a bit, pull back and say, all right, I want to go, so let's be kind, gentle, and compassionate in the midst of going. Let's use it as a moment to learn. Let's use it as an interval session, not to prove something. We're not trying to beat anyone. We're not trying to measure up. We're not trying to be good enough. Let's just use this as a good hard workout and to see what happens to our technique when we ski on a really steep, long hill. So really informative. I spy with a little eye a beautiful old bedboard, which I turn into signs. Upon closer inspection, this bedboard turned out to be even more intricate and beautiful than I first thought, so I had to get it. <laughs> Good morning, Nunu. Good morning. You are very noisy chewers. Can we check out this shark belly? We're gonna get ripped to pieces. We're gonna get ripped to pieces if we touch the shark belly. Giant shark, you're such a big boy shark. Shorter ski today. My lungs are not feeling good yet. They wanna push back when I breathe in. And my triceps are smoked from the hammer session that I did yesterday. I was exploring a new way to pole just by using the, the bottom half Instead of using lats and core, I was just working the triceps and I'm really feeling it today. So about nine miles, uh, I really got to get over the lung thing. I'm doing a Lake Placid Loppet this weekend and we'll see if I, if I do okay, maybe Austria, we'll see. About three inches of very dense, heavy, wet snow, which is harder to shovel than a foot of powder. It's been a long morning of chores. It's almost 10 o'clock and I'm finally heading into the studio with driveway shoveling, getting wood and getting the sap buckets. Uh, it took almost three hours. Anyway, heading in and uh, got to catch up with clients, then ski in the new snow. Roads aren't great yet. Just take it nice and slow. I just spent the last 20 minutes in the car finishing the book, Don't You Know Who I Am? and then doing a book review going up on Patreon soon. And uh, I'm glad that book is over. <laughs> it was almost 20 hours long and so redundant. And I can't wait to start a new book. So I stuck it out in the car just to get through it. Now I'm heading up to the studio and 
and beginning my work day. A drizzly ski today. Dinner is quinoa and farro with broccoli, veggies, and a little bit of TVP. How did it get to be Friday so fast? I don't understand this. Anyway, I'm listening to Shame by Joseph Burgo. Just started yesterday. And I'm taking a few minutes here in the car, thinking about Shame. I like where he's going with this. I'm not fully on board, but Shame as a tool. Interesting. Anyway, I'm gonna head upstairs. Probably gonna skip skiing today. It's super windy and it's gonna be very, very windy all day. Not fun to ski in high wind. I think today might be a writing day. Need to dive a little deeper into my writing and at some point perhaps generate some income from it so that I can afford trips like the World Championships. <laughs> Doing some afternoon paraffin therapy. Ah. Oh, still a lot of ache and tightness in there. As I cleaned the studio today, I did sets of two dips at random intervals whenever I got stuck and then did some knees to bar as well. Decided to do some shorter polling sessions, but with the new Kruger technique where I'm going through a longer range of motion, it's a little bit harder than it was in the past. So hour and 15 minutes of that, that felt good. Considering the illness that I've had for the past month, my back is kind of tight and my lungs don't want to fully expand. So shorter sets on the pulling machine and more gentle with the pull-ups, knees to bar, dips, etc. Uh, has allowed me to continue to train, but not overload myself. So uh, I don't know what's going on, but in the past, this would happen a lot. Uh, you get sick and it lasts a while, especially if you're training. I could take maybe a month off from training and fully heal, but then I'm not ready for whatever is coming up. So it's a fine balance uh, when you're training for a big event. Uh, yeah, it's tough trying to avoid injury, trying to avoid illness. When you train a lot, your immune system is compromised. Uh, and that's just part and parcel for a course as an athlete. It's too cold for the sap to run today. So we'll boil down what we have into syrup. So these are what we boiled down yesterday. Saturday morning, and I'm getting ready for the Lake Placid Loppet, which I'll be racing in tomorrow. There's a 50K and a 25K, I'm doing 25. It's on the same course that they did the Olympic 50 kilometer race in 1980, when the Olympics were in Lake Placid. So fun to race on that course. So today is gonna to be a prep day. I'm gonna go skiing now. I also wanna test out some clothing because I'm not sure what to wear. It's gonna be in the single digits Fahrenheit, maybe low teens uh, when the race goes off. And now I know that for a ski race, you can't just walk to the start line two minutes before. You have to get in line in lanes, uh, probably 20 to 25 minutes in advance of the race starts, so you get a good position, which means that you have to be warm enough to be able to stand there for 20 to 25 minutes, but not too warm as to overheat during the race. And you can't take a jacket off because you have a race bib that's over whatever you're wearing. So I still don't know how to dress for skiing. Uh, and you can't take your gloves off if your hands get too hot because they're strapped into the poles. Um, in a snowshoe race, you could take your gloves off if you're too hot and just carry them. That was an awesome ski. So much fun to ski and fresh snow coming down. My technique is feeling good. I'm putting it together and I feel more confident than probably I ever have with my technique. So I'm excited to test that out in tomorrow's race. Feeling good. Um, we'll see what happens. My mom and dad just left I put my mom through a workout in my gym 
and now I've got to finish getting ready for tomorrow's race. <sighs> got to wax my skis, which is not a fun activity, but you got to do it. I just finished packing and I've decided to go with my camel toe gloves, which have two big slots for your fingers and then one for your thumb. I skied with those today and I kept my fingers warm. My regular racing gloves did not. And as I think about tomorrow's race and the preparation, I'm thinking about Austria, the World Championships. I've got to make that decision tomorrow. Uh, the entry closes tomorrow at 6 p.m. my time, midnight, Austria time. And um, I'm leaning towards not going. Tomorrow's race is partially a deciding factor. If I'm feeling good, even with my lungs the way they are, and I ski well, there's a, a greater chance that I'll decide to go. But the main consideration is the money. Uh, I mapped it out and it's a minimum of like 2,500 bucks. Canada was a lot cheaper last year for the Worlds. So do I spend $2,500 just to go do three races? Does that make sense? How does that work with the current focus of this project for me? Which is that lots of little movement steps without a plan, without willpower, without discipline, without pain and suffering, but gentle engagements asking your body if it's willing to take this small step, if it wants to or not. And if it does, then let's take it. Let's see what happens. So for the past two and a half years, I have immersed myself in skiing, all things skiing, uh, after a 30 some year gap and just lots and lots and lots of little steps working on technique, being deliberate, being really mindful Okay, what am I doing with my hands, with my wrists, with my elbows, with my shoulders, with my core, with my legs, each joint in the body, just being really intentional and gentle. And two and a half years later, I'm ridiculously fit, much more fit than I ever was as a runner. And the way that I go about training is dramatically different than as a runner. So, do I need to demonstrate my fitness on a world championship stage in order to legitimize this process? I don't know, that's what I thought. I thought that would open people up to the possibility of training like this because it's antithetical to most people's mental paradigms of being an elite athlete. Uh, it, just seems counterintuitive that if you want to compete at the highest level, you've got to push and push and push. But I don't push anymore. I allow myself to be pulled a little bit at a time. Um, and again, no plan. It's just random acts of engagement and mindful practice. So it would be great to stand on that stage and compete again like I did in Canada and actually get on the podium this time. And I'm fit enough to do that, but there's a lot of things working against me. Um, skis, uh, I would probably have to get a new pair of skis if I'm going, so it's not just a $2,500 to go to Austria, but getting a pair of warm weather or wet skis. I have a pair of universal skis, which are okay in all conditions, but they're not super fast in warm or cold conditions. So those people with a fleet of skis, which is the technical term they use at the World Cup level, uh, they have dozens of skis to choose from. And even at a master's level, many of these people have been skiing for many decades and they have quite a few pair of skis to choose from. And they're gonna have a cold ski, a universal ski and a warm ski. So going there, knowing that the average temperature is gonna be a high of 50 at that point in March in Seefeld, Austria, 
and the lows are around 30 at night, so it's going to be mushy snow. It's going to be warm, mushy snow. Um, and spending all the money to go there and for lodging and then to not even have the right skis doesn't make sense. So I'm running all these calculations and trying to figure out what are my chances of performing well? What are my chances of a podium performance? What's working against me? And is it worth the cost? Is this an investment or is this just a careless expense that really isn't necessary? And perhaps through videos and some local races, I can slowly build an awareness for the training methodology that I have now, which isn't even really a methodology anymore. Um, I wanna show people that you can be gentle and get into phenomenal shape. Do I need to go to this race to prove that, to demonstrate that for people to listen? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm going to race tomorrow in Lake Placid. And we'll see. We'll see how I do. We'll see how I feel. Uh, my ski today, my technique is getting good. Um, and that's exciting. It's just, it's so much fun to work on something. And I don't want to say work hard because that's not what I do. But to just work within the arena of, okay, I am really going to get in touch with every single movable part in my body and I'm gonna play around with them in the midst of using power and in the midst of finding balance. And I'm just gonna keep dialing joints in different directions and different angles. And I have so much in love with that process. And skiing requires so much diversity of technique. You're not just using the same motion like you do in running, like I just have to hold this motion for 26.2 miles and we'll get a good result. Constantly changing. Um, there's like 25 or 30 different techniques you need to uh, be really good at in order to do well in a race. So I just love that. There's so much to learn. It, it's really such a, a mind and body expanding sport that I'm going to continue doing it even if I don't go to Worlds or uh, compete at a big level. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm at a, a point where I've got to figure out what is the future of this project? What is the future of my work? How important is it for me to demonstrate the results of this method? Uh, and not put myself into debt. I, I would have to take on some serious debt in order to go to this race. And maybe that's not the smart choice. Maybe I could uh, spend that money elsewhere to greater effect. Anyway, I'm gonna wax my skis. See ya. Dinner is quinoa and rice with some TVP, broccoli, carrots, and a tiny bit of lo mein noodles. It's 5.30 a.m. race morning. Got to head to the studio, scrape off the last layer of wax, and head to Lake Placid, which is two and a half hours away. And it's snowing pretty hard, so it could be a sketchy trip. Blueberry, banana, maple, cacao smoothie for breakfast. Taking a quick pit stop at the Adirondack Welcome Center in Glens Falls. Gonna get the massage gun out. Massage my butt. It's a smart thing to put on the back of a bathroom door. Most people think of New York as just the city. <laughs> but everything north of New York, otherwise known as upstate, is pretty extraordinary, especially the Adirondack Park, where I'm going. Lake Placid is right there. And this is the largest park in the United States. It's six million acres full of lakes and mountains and wilderness. I have an hour to go and it's now started freezing rain. Uh, I can't even clear the windshield. This is not good. The roads are gonna get treacherous. The 
freezing rain has changed to snow as it get closer to the high peaks region. I stopped to check out the road conditions and they are very slippery. I'm gonna keep going, but uh, I'm gonna take it super slow and I may not make the start. We'll see. Thank goodness I gave myself over three hours to get here because wow, that was a, a white knuckle drive. <laughs> Oy, all right. I have an hour before the race. I'm not quite sure what to do with myself. I don't know how to prepare for a ski race. I know I need to be at the start line at least 15 minutes prior to get a good position, but the warm up and, and clothing to wear and shed and all that stuff is, uh, it's new to me. So I gotta figure all this out. And I gotta shake off that drive. My butt is numb. My legs are sluggish. The official vehicle of Mount Van Hovenberg, the Chevy Whiteout. This lodge is a massive upgrade from the lodge they had when I was at the Junior Olympics here in 1988. <laughs> that was a humbling experience. I have never skied in a race that tough before, and I don't think I've ever felt my legs fail like that outside of a stair climb. It was just intense. <laughs> Suffer fast. The hills, my God. We climbed almost 2,200 feet in 25 kilometers. It was two 12 and a half K laps with about 1,100 feet per lap. And the hills were so steep and long and relentless. And they were four, I think four super killer hills per lap and then a bunch of small ones where i got to v2 i did really really well my v2 is on uh, it's dialed and i'm super confident but where i had to go into a v1 on the climbs my legs just gave out the good news is that they recovered pretty quickly so on every downhill after the super steep ups my legs would be fine when i got to the bottom of the downhill and then i could charge for a bit more um, but then at the top of every steep uphill they'd be absolutely gas like screaming at me um, I got second overall which is exciting uh, it wasn't a super deep field uh, I tried to stay with the guy in the lead and wherever we were v2ing I was right with him and super comfortable but on the steep climbs, he'd pull away and then I'd catch him when we got to a place where I could V2 again and he'd pull away and I'd catch him and then finally he pulled away and my legs just, they were done and I couldn't catch him again. So my wax was decent, it was good enough. Um, nobody was skiing super fast today on this snow, but, um, oh. So this is my second water bottle failure. The first was Worlds last year in the 45K where the bottle froze and I couldn't take a feed. Today, I tried to drink at 10K and it's a new water bottle, which is insulated. Uh, costs like 40 bucks. Anyway, I thought, oh, it's not gonna freeze because it's insulated, but I couldn't open it. So I'm futzing around trying to open it on a gradual downhill. And my hand is in front of me, holding the water bottle, trying to look at it. And I forgot that there's a pole attached to my hand. So the pole was at like a 45 degree angle pointing down as I'm trying to manipulate this thing. And I stuck it in the snow, in the track in front of me. And it hit me in the chest and knocked me flat. Like it stopped me. I was probably moving at 10, 15 miles an hour. I wasn't a steep downhill. And it just stopped me in my tracks and threw me on my back, crushed my heart rate monitor, broke it. Uh, and thank God I was wearing the heart rate strap because it probably would have shattered my sternum. Um, sternum is bruised and it really hurts. Uh, it was hard to breathe after that and my heart took a major, uh, major hit. It went into shock. It didn't go into SVT, thankfully, but uh, it was really unstable for at least five miles after that and it still my sternum is not good. It hurts when I breathe in deep. Anyway, thank God I was wearing the heart rate strap. That 
scared the crap out of me. Uh, it's the second time I've done that. Futzing with a water bottle. I didn't do it at Worlds, but I was practicing with a water bottle at Prospect. And I did the same thing. I forget that there's poles attached to my hand. And you're trying to look at the thing and the pole is sticking straight out in front of you. And if it touches the track, bad things happen. So, even though I did well today, the weakness in my legs, um, and I skied hard up those hills, I wasn't taking it easy. I, I gave it everything I had. Um, but still, I my arms never got tired. My arms, lats, core never got tired. But my legs would give out on every hill. So... I don't feel confident going to Worlds. I've been on the fence just due to the expense. If I were to win, maybe that would be worth it, but I don't even think so. But now, with my legs feeling the way they do, um, I don't think it's a, a wise investment. So I'm gonna, I'm going to bail on Worlds trained over a thousand hours just for this event and now I'm pulling the plug and part of me just feels lost but another part of me is saying it's okay we'll just bounce we'll keep taking our small steps we'll keep training we'll keep learning how to ski better and better and we'll get some strong legs we're going back to the drawing board or the sliding board and we're gonna get some tree trunk legs <laughs> so, yeah, now I, I have this big hole in front of me. I don't want to try to fill it yet, but I also have to be careful of just kind of spitting out, not knowing what to do. So I'm going to keep myself plugged into training, uh, plugged into writing more than I have. I've been um, spending a lot of time thinking about this trip, trying to manage the trip, etc., um, researching different things and I could have been putting that time into writing. So I'm going to try to get a volume two of my audiobook done in the next month or so. It's long overdue. Okay, I'm gonna head home now. Hopefully the roads are better. There was such a white knuckle drive on the way here. My God. <laughs>